These are reference for this lecture. These are uh, references for this lecture. So today we will cover many different topics. So I will, I couldn't, I cannot uh, explain uh, deeply. So you, you need, you have to uh, look at these references after this class. And also, you can download uh, example code from this GitHub, and then uh, you can test that code. OK, let's start with ERC721 NFT standard. You may heard about this standard. It's very popular. There are two types of asset, fungible asset and non-fungible asset. Fungible asset means uh, it is exchangeable, like cash or Bitcoin, Ethereum. So in order to create fungible asset, we use uh, EIC20 token standard. On the contrary, in order to make create non-fungible asset, we need different standard. It is called EIC721 uh, token standard, NFT standard. ES721 is a standard interface for non-fungible asset on the Ethereum. But in other platforms, uh, the standard is very similar. So if you understand uh, how to use ERC721, uh, you, can, you can create um, fungible asset in other platforms. Why should we use uh, ERC721 standard? It is a standard, so we can save time and resources to develop because there are tons of reference implementations. So we can uh, just utilize those references to create our own. And uh, ERC721 NFT easily interact with various wallets, marketplaces, and decentralized application on Ethereum because they understand ERC721 interface. So uh, when I mint my NFT uh, with ERC721, I can see my uh, NFT on uh, MetaMask or Open uh, OpenSea. So, uh, ERC721 NFT standard can uh, allow users to own, transfer, and manage unique digital assets. In the digital world, it's not trivial to uh, make digital items uh, unique or scarce because uh, digital items can be easily copied. So uh, before blockchain, there was no way to uh, make, to create digital scarcity. But after uh, uh, ERC721 NFT, we can easily uh, establish digital scarcity with our digital items or digital data. There are many use cases for ERC721 and NFTs. Uh, the famous one, the famous one is gaming. So currently there are a lot of Web3 games and blockchain based games uh, to use, uh, to use uh, NFT uh, for their game items or in-game currencies. And digital art and collectibles. Many artists started, uh, started to mint their uh, digital art, NFT, and then sold this NFT on OpenSea uh, back in 2020 and 2021. So it is, it, it is, it makes another way to monetize their artwork uh, for artists. And virtual, the central land and the sandbox, those services created a met metaverse 
And in this metaverse, they sold their virtual land and virtual buildings uh, as NFT. And domain names and ticket. Ticket is very uh very good example to use uh NFT in real world. Uh, I think you can you can uh design a new type of ticket uh with NFT uh embedding good good features. So it it, it can change uh traditional event uh traditional ticket business. And music and media, many artists, many artists tokenized their work like album or their song, uh, and then sold this tokenized asset to their fans. So it is very uh uh this will this may uh, this may uh, innovate uh, traditional music business or media business. And identity and certification is a good, uh, very important use case for NFT. So we can uh, mint education certificate uh, with NFT. Nowadays, uh, people think about uh, SBT for certificate or identity. So I will explain uh, SBT uh, later. How ERC721 NFTs work? Uh, it's a little bit complicated than ERC20 because uh, there are two parts. One is on-chain part and the other is off-chain part. On-chain part means uh, blockchain part. So NF some part of NFT data will be stored on blockchain, but other data like meta metadata and target content file will be stored on uh, public data store, other stores, not blockchain, like uh, cloud or decentralized file system like IPFS. And NFT contains token URI. This token URI point to metadata. And this metadata contains the link to target content file. Do, um, there is a reason why uh, NFT split two different stories. Blockchain is very expensive stories. So we cannot put very big content file into blockchain. So we have to we have to store uh, large data like content file or even metadata. We need to put those data into on-chain stories. So uh when we when we develop nft we have to consider two different part two different part and then we have to program two different part so it's more complicated what is nft identifier how we can how can we identify a unique nft NFT identifier is the pair of contract address and token ID. So we can identify uh, each token with this pair. Co uh, content itself is not involved into NFT identifier. It means you don't need to you don't need to make your contents unique uh, in order to create nft so nft can contain uh non unique contents also i'd like to show you uh erc721 nft example this example uh, come from SuperRare Marketplace. SuperRare 
is uh, digital artwork marketplace. And I think SuperRare is a very good uh, marketplace because they, uh, they shows uh, all information about NFT very transparently. So you can check every information on, on NFT in their website. I bring, I brought one example from um, Mr. Misang artist. Mr. Misang is very famous uh, digital artist in the world. Actually, he is a, a Korean and this is his 11 uh, artwork, digital artwork. And uh, he minted his digital artwork in Shopper And so, you can uh, see, uh, you can see uh, the contract address, and also you can see uh, either scan uh, page link and also metadata and IPFS uh, link. So when you click each menu, you can check that uh, that uh, result. This is how it works. Uh, with this example. As I said, NFT identifier is the pair of contract address, uh, 0xB932, blah, 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 and token ID, 23418. You can, you can, uh, you can, uh, you can search, you, you can get this information from either scan page. When you click the either scan link, uh, you you can see uh, the, the transaction hash, uh, transaction result page to mint this NFT. And then it, in this page, you can see contract address and token ID. And this contract and this and this NFT contains token URI information. And this token URI, when you click this token URI information, you can see uh, met metadata of this NFT. And this metadata uh, contains uh, the link, the URI to uh, target content file. So MP4 file. So uh in this process you can see you can understand how uh, this nft uh works and uh this this and uh, what this nft contains inside this is the difference between erc20 and uh, ERC721. When you, when you talk about ERC20 uh, token, there is just one uh, variable, balances. Balances manage only which addresses hold how many tokens. So just uh, one mapping table. But in case of ERC721 NFT, we need to manage several different variables, mapping variables. There is uh, owners variables. It contains, uh, it manage uh, mapping between token ID and the owner of this token ID, the address. And also token ID, the mapping between token ID and token URI. So when you, uh, when you uh, look for Mm, token URI, you need to uh, look at this variable, token URIs. So EIC721 implementation is more uh, complicated than EIC20. As I explained, uh, EIC20 token contains just uh, balances variable and allowances variable. 
I'm sure you can understand uh, this uh, ERC20 token uh, data structure because we already explained this structure. Uh, on the contrary, ERC721 NFT contains more variables, mapping variables, owners, balances, and token URIs, and token approvers and operator approvers. Token approvers is similar to allowances. So token approvers manage uh, the address uh, that uh, uh, that the token owner, NFT owner, approved to control this NFT. And but uh, operator, what is operator approvers? A person, a person can have, may have several different NFTs in a single contract. In this case, uh, if if we should if uh, a contract should uh, approve several times to control an account's NFT, it's very uh, it's waste of time and waste of uh, transaction cost. So in this case, uh, we can set uh, operators. We can set operators as an uh, an contract a contract to allow to control all NFTs of an account. So in this case, we have to set operator approvals. This is uh, EIC seven twenty one interface. You may you, you may understand all this code. Uh, it is a little bit similar to uh, ERC twenty token standard. Uh, red boxes are different part. Uh, owner owner of owner of functions re will return uh, the owner address uh, with a token ID, and safe transfer from uh, function is new. Uh, in ERC721 standard, uh, and I will explain these uh, functions later. And uh, uh, there is different approval function to set operator. In ERC721 uh, contract, uh, there are three different uh, different entity to initiate transfers. The first one is the owner of an NFT, uh, and the second one is approved address of an NFT. In this case, token approvers should be set uh, with um, approved address. And the last three, an authorized operator of, of the current owner uh, of an uh, account of an NFT. So in this case, it is required to be set in operator approves. It is different interface. Uh, when you see uh, Open Jefferson, uh, Open Jefferson GitHub, ERC, there are uh, several different interfaces and uh, contract implementation about ERC721 because uh, ERC721 is more complicated and they provide many options many options to implement ERC721 because when you uh, implement ERC721, it, uh, it uh, consume more storage on blockchain. So you need to decide, uh, you need to decide to use which interface is suitable for your purpose. ERC721 met metadata interface. So uh, ERC721 uh, uh, standard split uh, metadata 
from uh, ERC721 interface. So when you need a uh, meta layer for your ERC721 uh, token, you can uh, you can inherit this interface. And ERC721 receiver interface. Uh, any contract that wants to receive ERC721 NFT through safe transfer function should implement this interface. So when you call safe transfer from function uh, in uh, NFT contract, this function will check the receiving contract, the receiving contract implemented this interface. It, 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 so it shows uh, it shows the receiving contract can handle ERC721 NFTs. So uh, if uh, if the receiving contract don't have uh, don't have these uh, functions, this function, um, in this case, safe transfer function, safe transfer function will be liberated, and uh, NFT contract will ascend NFT to that contract. So it is, uh, it is, it pro, it protect, uh, it protect um, NFT contract from sending uh, non-supportive contract. Uh, sending NFTs to non-supportive contracts. Okay. So OpenJapplin, uh, OpenJapplin uh, provide ERC seven twenty NFT reference implementation. So you can easily inherit their uh, reference implementation to create your own NFT. So. Uh, it is easy to understand because it's very similar to ERC20 uh, implementation. Ledbox uh, line uh, 46 and line 57 is about uh, uh, ERC721 received. So uh, safe transfer from function will check uh, this part. So uh, in the function of safe transfer, uh, check on ERC721 received function will be called and uh, this function will check uh, the receiving uh, contract, uh, the uh, check if the receiving contract implemented the function uh, on receive on ERC seven twenty one received, and if that contract implemented that function, uh, it will be passed, and NFT will be sent. Will be sent. OpenJPL already uh, provide a reference implementation of ERC seven twenty one receiver, so it is uh, ERC seven twenty one holder contract it's very similar this contract this contract will this function on erc721 received will return the selector of this function so mm, it's not that difficult and then maybe uh your contract have to uh, uh ha your contract need more functions to control uh, NFT, receiving contract, uh, receiving NFTs. And it is another, it is another reference Im implementation of ERC721. In this case, uh, it is ERC721 URI storage. In this case, this implementation contains one more uh, mapping table. Mapping, uh, and this is uh, this is token URI variable. So it contains mapping between uh, token ID um, and uh, uh, token URI. 
So you can implement your NFT with uh, both ERC721 implementation and ERC721 URI storage implementation. When you, when you uh, inherit uh, ERC721 URI storage, it will consume it will consume more storage, so you need to pay for more transaction cost. So it's your choice. So this implementation contains different, uh, two different functions, such as token URI and set token URI function. Okay, uh, we learned, uh, we learned uh, what ERC721 uh, interface looks like and uh, let's move on to uh, mint our own ERC721 NFT. It's very simple. It is the entire code to mint our own NFT. Uh, my NFT contract inherit ERC721 URI stories and ownable contract uh, owner contract contains uh, only owner modifier, so we don't need to implement our own only owner modifier. Very simple. Uh, we defined one uh, more function, mint NFT. Mint NFT uh, can be called by only owner, uh, contract owner, and uh, in this contract, uh, in this contract, uh, this th this function mint NFT function will mint uh, new NFT with new new token ID, uh, and then uh, uh, and then put this NFT to recipient address, and also. Since we inherit ERC721 URI stories, we can set token URI for this token ID. This is uh, line 23. And one more thing. In this example, we used, we used a library, counters. So uh, we, uh, we learned a library last week. So Using for syntax, we use the using for syntax to use counters. So instead of using uh, uint256 uh, for our uh, token ID, we I defined uh, counters counter uh, for token ID and then call a function of counter. You, you, you need to uh, be familiar with uh, this kind of uses of rivalry. So actually uh, minting NFT is very simple, so simple. But, uh, but after uh, completing uh, contract, we have to, uh, we, we need something to do. First, we need to deploy this contract uh, so I deployed this contract on Sephora testnet. In this case, uh, uh, yes. Uh, so uh, when you when you deploy your smart contract to uh, to Sephora testnet or mainnet, the the e the easiest way is to use is to use uh, Remix. Uh, I use the Remix. Uh, with injected provider, uh, in other words, MetaMask, and then uh, I can deploy my smart contract, yeah, NFT smart contract into a uh, separate uh, network. And then I can use to mint, I can use Remix to mint uh, my NFT to core uh, mint NFT functions. So, it is, it is the easiest way, but you have to, you have to uh, put your uh, metadata, you have to create your metadata like this, 
uh, black box. Uh, and then you need to put this meta layer into IPFS or AWS cloud. And then you, you need to get a uh, unique uh, URI and then put this URI into, uh, into Remix as an argument. So these are a uh, difficult part. As a next step, I, uh, I, uh, I developed NFT Minter, uh, NFT Minter service with a React front end. It's very simple, uh, NFT Minter. Actually, it is, it is called, uh, come from um, Alchemy. Uh, they provide this example. You can learn uh, how to create NFT Minter with a very simple React front end. When you download, uh, uh, when you download uh, my code, example code from GitHub, you can see uh, those code. And uh, in this slide, I will explain uh, uh, explain uh, front end code a little bit. Uh, when 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 I when I uh, when I see the web page on web browser, this page, this page uh, will contain some JavaScript code to connect to MetaMask, uh, such as connect wallet and get current wallet connected. Uh, actually, we already uh, learned this code uh, in lecture 10 and lecture nine. So uh, I will skip this code. And then uh, when user when a user put uh, their uh, their uh, name the NFT name and NFT descriptions and URI information into this web page, um, this JavaScript will create JSON with user input, and then uh, this page will send JSON to Pinata server through HTTP POST request. And then Pinata server uh, put this data JSON file uh, into IPFS. Uh, it is called pinning. So I will explain um, Pinata and IPFS in more detail uh, later. So you don't need to worry about Pinata and IPFS. And then as a return, uh, IPFS content ID, CID will be returned uh, to, uh, to this JavaScript. And then this JavaScript code will make token URI uh, by combining uh, IPFS prefix and uh, CID. And then this JavaScript will send transaction with, uh, with a token URI and some some uh, with a token URI and some parameters uh, to uh, to the NFT ERC seven twenty one NFT contract, and then uh, mint NFT function will be called. So <laughs> uh, that's it. So when you when you see that JavaScript code, it it looks a little bit uh, complicated, but not that uh, not that. Actually, not that complicated. This is the part of uh, JavaScript code. Uh, you, as you can see in uh, line 105, this is uh, this function will call will call uh, pin JSON to IPFS function in order to uh, put JSON. Uh, file to IPFS, and then uh, we will get uh, CID. And uh, line 116, we create, we compose transaction parameters with, um, with tra uh, token URI and, uh, and uh, this account's address and method names, and then, we will send a transaction 
with these parameters to separate uh, network, uh, separate test net. So it is, it, it is line 125. Okay. Up until now, we create our own token, but we couldn't see our token in the web page or um, in the in the either scan page. We need to we need to import our NFTs to MetaMask to see our NFT. When you when you look at uh, MetaMask. Um, there is NFT tab. So you, in the NFT tab, you can see uh, NFT import menu. And then uh, you, need to, you need to put, uh, you need to enter uh, NFT contract address and token ID. And it is uh, NFT identifier. And how can I, how can I know mm, this information? Uh, it, it comes from either scan page. Either scan page, you can see, you can, uh, you can see contract address and token ID like this. And then finally, I can see my NFT uh, on MetaMask. And then I can transfer my NFT to other people. Okay, so, uh, I explained how to how to create our own NFT and how to deploy this NFT and how to mint NFT uh, with user input and also how to import this NFT on MetaMask. But I skipped I skipped uh, the details about uh, IPFS and Pinata. So in this section, I will explain IPFS and Pinata in more detail. IPFS is uh, a decentralized storage file system. And uh, which this IPFS uh, is built on fundamental principles like uh, P2P networking and content addressing. So many, uh, many concepts from distributed system, distributed system uh, computing. Interestingly, IPFS was, uh, was built before, uh, before uh, blockchain. So it is, very, uh, it is very old project. And uh, before blockchain, people used IPFS to store their files safely uh, in decentralized manner. So uh, combining blockchain and IPFS is very good choice to make our service decentralized. Uh, I'd like to I'd like to show you a YouTube video to explain IPFS very easily and very simply. I think it is the best. Uh, YouTube video to explain uh, the basic of IPFS. It's such an important tool in our everyday life. We use it to consume media, to communicate with friends and colleagues, to learn, to handle our finances, and much more. But the web as we know it has a problem. The information on it is centralized. It's all stored on big server farms like this one, and these are usually controlled by a single company. I mean, have you ever wondered what would happen if sites like YouTube or Wikipedia would go offline? How would you watch cat videos or spend hours reading one Wikipedia page after the other? The centralization brings another problem with it, and that is censorship. Because content is hosted on just a few servers, it's easy for governments to block access to them. In 2017, Turkey ordered internet providers to block access to Wikipedia because the administration called it a threat to national security. So you get the idea. Centralization of the web isn't a good thing. But then why do we keep using such a model? Well, that's because we have high expectations when it comes to the web. 
We want pages, images, and videos to load instantly, and we want them in high quality. Centralizing servers allows companies to have complete control over how fast it can deliver all of this content. Another reason we use this model is that there just isn't a good and fast alternative. But that might be about to change. Meet IPFS, the Interplanetary File System. That's a fancy name and they have very ambitious goals as well. They want to make the web completely distributed by running it on top of a peer-to-peer -peer network that works similarly to how BitTorrent works. Let's take a look at how IPFS can accomplish these goals, but first you have to understand how we access content on the web right now. Let's say you want to download a photo from the internet. When you do that, you tell the computer exactly where to find the photo. In this case, the location of the photo is the IP address or the domain name. This is called location-based addressing. You tell the computer where to get the information, but if that location isn't accessible, in other words, the server is down, you won't get that photo. However, when that happens, there is a high chance that someone else has downloaded that picture before and still has a copy of it, but yet your computer won't be able to grab a copy from that person. To fix this, IPFS moves from location-based addressing to content-based addressing. Instead of saying where to find a resource, you just say what it is you want. But how does that work? Well, every file has a unique hash, which can be compared to a fingerprint. When you want to download a certain file, you just ask the network who has the file with this hash, and someone on the IPFS network will provide it to you. Now you might think, hold on a minute, how do I know that that person hasn't tampered with the file? Well, because you use a hash function to request the file, you can verify what you have received. You request a file with a certain hash, so when you receive the file, you check if the hash matches with what you have received. Security built in. Another nice feature of using hashes to address content is deduplication. When multiple people publish the same file on IPFS, it will only be created once and that makes the network very efficient. Alright, enough with this high level overview, let's take a look at how IPFS stores files and makes them accessible to others. Files are stored inside IPFS objects and these objects can store up to 256 kilobytes worth of data. They can also contain links to other IPFS objects. A simple Hello World text file, which is very small, can be stored in a single IPFS object. But what about files that are larger than 256 kilobytes, like an image or a video for instance? Well, those are split up into multiple IPFS objects that are all 256 kilobytes in size, and afterwards, the system will create an empty IPFS object that links to all the other pieces of the file. IPFS's data architecture is very simple, but yet it can be very powerful. This architecture allows us to really use it as a file system. Here's a simple directory structure with some files in it. We can translate this into IPFS objects as well, creating one object for each file and each directory. But that is not all. You see, because IPFS uses content-based addressing, once something is added, it cannot be changed anymore. It's an immutable data store, much like a blockchain. But then how do we change stuff on it? Well, IPFS supports versioning of your files. Let's say you're working on an important document that you want to share with everyone over IPFS. When you do that, IPFS will create a new commit object for you. This object is really basic. It just tells IPFS which commit went before it, and it links to the IPFS object of your file. Now let's imagine that after a while you want to update this file. Well, you just add your updated file to IPFS and then the software will create a new commit object for your file. This commit object now links to the previous commit. And this process can be repeated endlessly. IPFS will make sure that your file plus all its entire history is accessible to other nodes on the network. Pretty useful. This all sounds great, but it's not without its limitations or drawbacks. The biggest problem that IPFS faces is keeping files available. Every node on the network keeps a cache of the files that it has downloaded and helps to share them if other people need them. But if a specific file is hosted by, let's say, four nodes, and those nodes go offline, then that file becomes unavailable and no one can grab a copy of it. A bit like BitTorrent swarms without seeders. There are two possible solutions for this problem. Either we incentivize people to store files and make them available, 
or we can proactively distribute files and make sure that there is always a certain number of copies available on the network. And that's exactly what Filecoin intends to do. Filecoin is created by the same group of people that have created IPFS. It's basically a blockchain built on top of IPFS that wants to create a decentralized market for storage. If you have some free space on your hard drive, you can rent it out to others and make money of it in the process. Filecoin creates a strong incentive for nodes to keep the files online for as long as possible, because otherwise they won't get rewarded. The system also makes sure that files are replicated on many nodes so they cannot become unavailable. That's just a quick summary of Filecoin and how it intends to build on top of IPFS to solve some of its issues. Leave a comment below if you want to learn more about Filecoin in a future video. Last thing we're going to take a look at is how IPFS can be used. As I mentioned before, in 2017, the Turkish government decided to block access to Wikipedia. The people behind IPFS responded by taking the Turkish Wikipedia and putting a copy of it on IPFS. And because IPFS is distributed and there are no central servers, the government can't block it. Another nice application is DTube, which is basically a site like YouTube, but entirely distributed and hosted on IPFS. Anyone can publish videos and anyone can help to support the network. Pretty clever. But by now you must be wondering, why is IPFS called the interplanetary file system? Is it suited to run across multiple planets? Well, let's assume that we have a base. Okay, I think uh, it's enough. So we stop mm, this video and then come back to the slide. Mm. Okay, uh, I'm very impressed because this YouTuber uh, explained uh, IPFS very well and very easily. There were tons of information on uh, IPFS and materials, but those materials are very complicated because they usually explain the detail or technical detail about uh, IPFS. So uh, this video is the easiest way to, to learn IPFS as a user, uh, not as a developer of, of, of IPFS. As you can you 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 saw in the video, uh, IPFS uh, IPFS addressing is uh, very unique. It is content addressing. So when you put your files into IPFS, IPFS uh, hash this file content and then return CID. So when you hash some contents, you can get a unique ID. So it is called the CID, contents ID. When you, when you get this ID, uh, you can look at, look up this file with this CID. And if a file contents is modified, the hash result of this content will be changed. So CID will be changed. So we uh, so we can we can check the content is changed or not. So CID makes a file tamper proof. It's very good uh, good features for IPFS. Uh, combining uh, blockchain and IPFS, we can achieve tamper proof of our NFT, even in trustless nodes. Actually, blockchain and IPFS uh, are, running, uh, are running on trustless node. We don't know who, uh, who are running this node. So, uh, so we, we, we may worry about uh, someone can modify, temper my contents. But don't worry about that because uh, in IPFS, content addressing will check uh, if my file is tempered. And blockchain uh, part, when we put some data into blockchain, it is immutable. And uh, 
and also uh uh this this kind of, we we have three different contents in in nft uh nft uh data itself including uh token URI and metadata and target contents file so uh first three ha after hashing uh target content file we will get uh cid and uh, and then put this CID into met metadata, and then hashing this metadata, and then get another CID, and then put this CID into token URI on blockchain. So if uh, one of this data is changed, we can check this file or this contents is changed. So, uh, in some case, uh, in some case, uh, we can we can store our file into cloud like AWS, but in this case, we cannot guarantee uh, my file is modified or not because someone can uh, can attack my file, my server, and also. Uh, we cannot guarantee the persist permanently uh, learning of AWS cloud, but IPFS we can guarantee the permanence of learning IPFS nodes. So where should I start IPFS? You can install IPFS node in your local PC or laptop. Or you can install a Brave, Brave browser because Brave browser embed IPFS extension. So you can, uh, so Brave browser plays a role of IPFS node. So I will show you my uh, IPFS node. This is Bra Brave browser, and you can see uh, here I imported three different files into IPFS for my NFT. And I can get this CID uh, like this. And uh, when I when I click peers, there are tons, you, you, you can see tons of uh, peers, IPFS nodes to connect to my laptop. And they uh, they get my file or they put my file into my uh, my node. Four hundred forty seven peers, and I can check how other peers use my computer like this. So this is IPFS. Okay, but there is a problem when using IPFS because uh, availability is limited in IPFS. When, uh, the first step is uh, importing a file in your local IPFS node and it returns a CID for your file, but it doesn't guarantee this CID uh, will be discoverable and retrievable from other nodes. The next step, the important step is pinning a file with your CID. It allows the node to advertise your CID to other uh, IPFS nodes. And then if some nodes ask, uh, ask your node uh, this file, you can provide this node can provide the file to other nodes. Some IPFS nodes retrieved uh, your file from IPFS. The file will be cached in that node, but there is a garbage collection scheme in IPFS. So sometimes later, that cached file will be deleted. So we need to uh, we need to, we need uh, a way we need a method to retain 
uh, my file in IPFS. There are two options. The first one is you can learn your own IPFS node uh, without stopping and pin your file. And the second option is you can use uh, pinning services. These pinning services usually learn lots of IPFS nodes and you can, you can pin your data in these uh, pinning services. There are a few pinning services such as Pinata, Web Series Stories, and NFT Dust Stories. Uh, in my case, I used Pinata. Pinata is very popular in uh, blockchain space. There is another service about uh, IPFS, IPFS Gateway. When I get uh, when I get a CID from IPFS, the the normal IPFS pass is IPFS uh, pass is like that. So I this pass uh, contains IPFS prefix instead of HTTP blah blah blah. So some browsers or some services don't understand this IPFS pass. So in this case, uh, people use IPFS gateway URL. IPFS gateway translate this URL into IPFS pass and retrieve IPFS file and then return that file. So um, IPFS gateway URL is the same as HTTP URL. Uh, you can, uh, there are uh, several ways uh, to provide IPFS gateway. You can install your own local gateway. And the second option is you can use private gateway uh, as a cloud service uh, like Pinata. So in my case, I used, uh, I am using Pinata uh, private gateway. So I have my own gateway address. And last, last uh, way is you can use public gateway with, with no fee, uh, it's free. So you can, uh, you can make token URI with public gateway uh, URL, but in this case, uh, this public gateway have uh, traffic limitations. So you cannot guarantee the performance. So uh, uh, firstly, I used the Pinata as a public gateway. The performance was, uh, uh, was totally bad. So I changed, I, I paid more. So I got my own private gateway and I used that. This is Pinata uh, dashboard. I will show you my Pinata dashboard. This is it, very simple. I imported my, uh, my files and uh, API, uh, I call Pinata API and then put this, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, JSON, JSON information into that. And this is my private gateway address. So I used this one. And they have a API key. So I can I can uh, put uh, my file or JSON data with this API in JavaScript. Okay. It's more complicated uh, compared to ERC20. When you implement ERC20, there is no this concept because uh, ERC20 uh, token is learned on only blockchain, but uh, but NFT uh, needs on-chain part uh, as well as off-chain part. So you have to handle off-chain part. It makes it makes uh, a lot of works. It makes a lot of works. Okay, uh, I finished uh, ERC721 part. So um, is there any question 
about ERC721 or IPFS or PINATA? Okay, uh, move on to uh, next topic, ERC-1155. It is a multi-token standard. It's, it's also very famous. Let's imagine a, a scenario to create, to make a game uh, with, uh, with NFT. If we need multiple tokens, uh, usually game has uh, a game has a lot of different uh, items or currencies. So uh, we need multiple tokens to to implement Web3 games or blockchain based games. For example, in this example, we have two different currencies: gold currency and silver currency. We can implement this currency as ERC20 tokens. And also uh, there are uh, two different items, uh, game items, sword and shield. We can implement this, uh, I, these items uh, with ERC20 tokens. And there is, uh, there is a, a, a unique game item, crown. We can implement this, uh, this with ERC721 NFT. We have five different token. In this case, we need to we need we need five contract. So wow, we have to create five different contract and deploy this five contract. Uh, so it makes it makes high uh, a lot of gas fee and redundant code and managing cost. So here comes ERC eleven fifty five. ERC-1155 can create and manage uh, five tokens in a single contract. So it is called multi-token standard. That's it. It is, uh, it is uh, ERC-1155 token example. As you can see, uh, we just defined the five different uh, token type. So, uh, it is gold token uh, gold token type ID is zero and silver token ID, token type ID is one. So uh, and then when we mint when we mint this token, we have to specify uh, token type ID like gold, silver, sword, and shield, crown, and then the total amount total supply. That's it. It's very simple. How is it possible? Actually, all operations of blockchain, such as transfer, are just changing states by writing, rewriting a ledger, blockchain. They don't send, they don't send the token uh, actually. They just modify balances variable. So it is just writing, it is just writing a lecture, a lecture. So we can, if we can, uh, we, if we can define, uh, define several tokens in a single contract, we can handle several tokens at the same time in a single contract. So it is ERC-1155. It is a token uh, standard interface uh, for contracts that manage multiple token types. So uh, we can, uh, we can contain uh, different token types uh, such as fungible tokens and non-fungible tokens, even semi-fungible tokens in a single contract. So uh, one of co-creator of ERC-1155 mentioned uh, this interface, this standard is a vending machine 
for NFTs and fungible tokens with advanced features uh, like batch transfers. So we can transfer many different tokens in a single transaction with low gas fee. So it's very efficient. There are many benefits to use ERC-1155. We can send uh, multiple token types in a single transaction, uh, and we can reduce transaction cost and save time. And also we can uh, reduce the code. There are already uh, many projects using ERC-1155 uh, games, uh, such as Engine, uh, Horizon Games. They are using uh, uh, ERC-1155. And NFT marketplace, such as OpenSea, Rarible, Superlayer, they understand ERC-1155. They support this standard. And uh, virtual world like uh, the sandbox, decentral rent, uh, they support uh, ERC eleven fifty five. So uh, when you when you create uh, your NFT, maybe you will use ERC eleven uh, fifty five instead uh, ERC seven twenty one because it is more efficient. It is ERC eleven fifty five interface. Uh, two different functions, balance of batch and safe batch transfer from. You can imagine what functions, uh, uh, what functions, uh, what this function works. And one more, uh, one more new argument ID. You have to specify a token type when you, when you call each functions. OpenJPRINT provide a uh, reference implementation for this standard. You have to, you have to look at uh, line 24, it's balances variable, but it's different from ERC20 and ERC721 because it, it is two dimensional. So it contains, uh, each token types balances. So, so when you call, uh, when you see, when you look at this balances variable, you need to put, you need to specify ID, token type ID. And uh, ES 1155 uh, don't uh, include uh, uh, and uh, token metadata. Usually, we we contained some metadata for uh token, but in this case, uh, a single contract contains several different tokens. So if you put uh token information, token metadata information into contract, it consume a lot of storage. So they in this case just specify. URI information, uh, URI information to extract uh, token metadata information. So it is off chain. Mm. And as you can see in line uh, 85, uh, it is batch function. It is how batch function works. Uh, there is a for loop. We we firstly we met uh, for roof in contract. Uh, it is uh, because it is batch function. So uh, it's very simple. You can understand how it works. It is a uh, safe batch transfer from functions. In line two hundred eleven. Uh, you can see this code uh, decrease the sender's balances and increasing the receiver's balances for, uh, for each uh, token type. It is 
it, 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 is, uh, it is the same way as ERC20. But what about NFTs? In case of NFT, we have to change owner. But in this code, there is no code like that. So Open Jeopardy in EIC 1155 reference implementation don't support NFT in this case. So I brought another implementation from Engine Coin. It is uh, ERC 1155 mixed fungible, uh, mixed fungible uh, contract. In this contract, you can see the two functions is non-fungible, is fungible function. So these functions can decide if uh, token type ID is fungible or non-fungible. And then uh, when this code, uh, when this code, uh, when this code process, um, uh, process batch transfer, uh, first three, uh, token type is uh, check the token type. And then if the token type is non-fungible uh, in line uh, 89, uh, change the owner. So we can use uh, this implementation uh, if our ELC 1155 contains non-fungible token. Okay, uh, lastly, I will, uh, I'd like to show you uh, ERC 1155 use case. It is very uh, famous, uh, famous uh, case. Uh, two years ago, maybe 2021, 20, Adidas minted their first token with ERC 1155 because uh, they, wanted to have a different page from phase one to phase four. So initially, when, when, they, when they mint initial uh, token in phase one, uh, it, is, uh, it, is, uh, it is fungible, it is fungible token. And then uh, this token can be redeemed to Phase two token, it is also fungible token, and then uh, and then redeemed and phase three token, and then finally in phase four you can get uh, final uh, NFTs. So why they why did they uh, design their NFT like that? They wanna give uh, their customers different experience in different page. So they designed different benefit in different page and token uh, NFT holders, yeah, yeah, these token holders should follow this page and they have to, uh, they have to redeem uh, each token for, uh, for getting benefits. So, uh, I'd like to show you uh, their code. This is this is uh, Adidas NFT uh, ERC eleven fifty five smart contract. So you can see their code in either scan, and I recommend you you look at this code because. It's not that difficult. And uh, you can understand this code because I already explained uh, many parts. So in this code, uh, this smart contract, uh, inherit ERC 1155 factory pattern and max, uh, they defined max supply and early supply. And this is pre-mint in constructor. So uh when they pre-minting uh they mint initial nft and initial token to this address 
uh, with the amount of 380. It is called the pre-mint before selling their NFT uh, to public. And then uh, you can see start next stage means uh, when, uh, when they call this function, token ID will be increased. So it means uh, this contract will mint different token. And they define a uh, purchase window and a uh, bond window. And then early access sale. Uh, in this function, you can, uh, anyone, anyone can uh, purchase their initial token. So purchase function uh, do that. Uh, in the purchase function, uh, core mint function. So message sender will get uh, the amount of token and token ID is zero. Zero means initial token. Token ID, token type ID is zero. And then interesting part is redeem card for other. So when transiting the page, uh, you have to call this function and then uh, this function uh, will burn your token first and then mint next page token. So you will move to next page. It's very interesting. So, uh, and you can see other uh, code. Mm, there are 20 different code, but you can understand. Okay, let's get back to the slide. So I finished uh, ERC-1155 and we will have 10 minutes break to uh, 35. And then we will come back to uh, uh, last topic, soul bound token. Okay.